and then we were thrown upon our own resources. It did not take many minutes to discover that the sun was blazing like a bonfire and that the weather was of a melting temperature. It was a drowsing effect, too. In one place we came upon a large company of naked natives of both sexes and all ages, amusing themselves with the national pastime of surf bathing. Each heathen would paddle three or four hundred yards out to sea, taking a short board with him, then face the shore and wait for a particularly prodigious billow to come along. At the right moment he would fling his board upon its foamy crest, and himself upon the board, and here he would come whizzing by like a bombshell. It did not seem that a lightning express train could shoot along at a more hair-lifting speed. I tried surf bathing once, subsequently, but made a failure of it. I got the board placed right, and at the right moment too, but missed the connection myself. The board struck the shore in three quarters of a second without any cargo, and I struck the bottom about the same time with a couple of barrels of water in me. None but natives ever master the art of surf bathing thoroughly. At the end of an hour we may, had made the four miles and landed on a level point of land upon which was a wide extent of old ruins, with many a tall coconut tree growing among them. Here was the ancient city of refuge, a vast enclosure whose stone walls were twenty feet thick at the base and fifteen feet high, an oblong square a thousand and forty feet one way and a fraction under seven hundred the other. Within this enclosure, in early times, had been three rude temples, each two hundred and ten feet long by one hundred wide and thirteen high. In those days, if a man killed another anywhere on the island, the relatives were privileged to take the murderer's life. And then a chase for life and liberty began, the outlawed criminal flying through pathless forests and over mountain and plain with his hopes fixed upon the protecting walls of the city of refuge and the avenger of blood following hotly after him. Sometimes the race was kept up to the very gates of the temple and the panting pair sped through long files of excited natives who watched the contest with flashing eye and dilated nostril, encouraging the hunted refuge with sharp and spiriting ejaculations and sending up a ringing shout of exultation when the saving gates closed upon him and the cheated pursuer sank exhausted at the threshold. But sometimes the flying criminal fell under the hand of the avenger at the very door when one more brave stride, one more brief second of time would have brought his feet upon the sacred ground and barred him against all harm. Where did these isolated pagans get this idea of a city of refuge, this ancient oriental custom? This old sanctuary was sacred, sacred to all, even to rebels in arms and invading armies. Once within its walls and confession made to the priest and absolution obtained, the wretch with a price upon his head could go forth without fear and without danger. He was taboo, and to harm him was death. The routed rebels in the lost battle for idolatry fled to this place to claim sanctuary, and many were thus saved. Close to the corner of the great enclosure is a round structure of stone, some six or eight feet high, with a level top about ten or twelve in diameter. This was the place of execution. A high palisade of coconut piles shut out the cruel scenes from the vulgar multitude. Here criminals were killed. The flesh stripped from the bones and burned, and the bones secreted in holes in the body of the structure. If the man had been guilty of a high crime, the entire corpse was burned. The walls of the temple are a study, the same food for speculation that is offered the visitor to the pyramids of Egypt he will find here. The mystery of how they were constructed by a people unacquainted with science and mechanics. 
The natives have no invention of their own for hoisting heavy weights. They had no beasts of burden, and they have never even showed any shown any knowledge of the properties of the lever. Yet some of the lava blocks quarried out, brought over rough, broken ground and built into this wall six or seven feet from the ground or of prodigious size and would weigh tons. How did they transport and how raise them? Both the inner and outer surfaces of the walls present a smooth front and are very creditably, creditable specimens of masonry. The blocks are of all manner of shapes and sizes but yet are fitted together with the neatest exactness. The gradual narrowing of the wall from the base upward is accurately preserved. No cement was used, but the edifice is firm and compact and is capable of resisting storm and decay for centuries. Who built this temple and how was it built? And when are mysteries that may never be unraveled? Outside of these ancient walls lies a sort of coffin-shaped stone, 11 feet 4 inches long and 3 feet square at the small end. It would weigh a few thousand pounds, which the high chief who held sway over this district many centuries ago brought thither on his shoulders one day to use as a lounge. The circum this circumstance is established by the most reliable traditions. He used to lie down on it in his indolent way and keep an eye on his subjects at work for him and see that there was no soldiering done and no doubt there was not any done to speak of because he was a man of that sort of build that incites to attention to business on the part of an employee. He was 14 or 15 feet high. When he stretched himself at full length on his lounge, his legs hung down over the end, and when he snored, he woke the dead. These facts are all attested by irrefragable tradition. On the other side of the temple is a monstrous seven-ton rock, eleven feet long, seven feet wide, and three feet thick. It is raised a foot or a foot and a half above the ground and rests upon half a dozen little stony pedestals. The same old fourteen-footer brought it down from the mountain merely for fun. He had his own notions about fun. And propped it up as we find it now, and as others may find it a century hence, for it would take a score of horses to budge it from its position. They say that fifty or sixty years ago the proud queen Kahumanu used to fly to this rock for safety whenever she had been making trouble with her fierce husband and hide under it until his wrath was appeased. But these Kanakas will lie, and this statement is one of their ablest efforts. For Kahumanu was six foot high, she was bulky, she was built like an ox and she could no more have squeezed herself under that rock than she could have passed between the cylinders of a sugar mill. What could she gain by it, even if she succeeded? To be chased and abused by a savage husband could not be otherwise than humiliating to her high spirit, yet it could never make her feel so flat as an hour's repose under that rock would. We walked a mile over a raised macadamized road of uniform width, a road paved with flat stones and exhibiting in its every detail a considerable degree of engineering skill. Some say that that wise old pagan Kamehameha I planned and built it, but others say it was built so long before his time that the knowledge of who constructed it has passed out of the traditions. In either case, however, as the handiwork of an untaught and degraded race, it is a thing of pleasing interest. The stones are worn and smooth and pushed apart in places so that the road has the exact appearance of those ancient paved highways leading out of Rome, which one sees in pictures. The object of our tramp was to visit a great natural curiosity at the base of the foothills, a congealed cascade of lava, 
Some old forgotten volcanic eruption sent its broad river of fire down the mountainside here, and it poured down in a great torrent from an overhanging bluff some fifty feet high to the ground below. The flaming torrent cooled in the winds from the sea and remains there today. All seamed and frothed and rippled, a petrified Niagara. It is very picturesque and withal so natural that one might almost imagine it still flowed. A smaller stream trickled over the cliff and built up an isolated pyramid about 30 feet high, which has the semblance of a mass of large, gnarled, and knotted vines and roots.